Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Uh, happy Thursday to you and yours. We're almost uh, to the weekend. I'm excited about the weekend. I hope you are as well. I'm excited about today's show. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, the wonderful and lovely and smart Jill Savage is here with me in studio today. Uh, that is awesome because uh, we have a topic uh, that lends itself to a female perspective. Uh, Emmy Aduko, the head basketball coach of the Boston Celtics, as you guys know, in the news uh, last night and today, uh, potentially facing a year-long suspension for what Sham Shania uh, is reporting is to believe to be a consensual uh, workplace relationship with a Boston Celtics staffer. Uh, I think there's more to the story. We'll, we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, Steve Kim's going to be here, Shamika Michelle. Uh, we're going to bring Tiffany Odom because after I get through this A block with Jill and, and Steve, uh, I'm going to turn the conversation over to the ladies and we're going to talk a little bit about Adam Levine and Emmy Aduka. Uh, and then Delano uh, Squires is going to round out the show. Uh, we're going to get dive a little bit deeper into both of these topics, Adam Levine, Emmy Aduka, uh, just workplace environment and expectations. Fantastic show uh, planned for you. I, again, we want to start today, though, with uh, what's going on with the Boston Celtics and what's going on with the conversation around Emmy Aduko and, and the media reaction. I was amazed this morning uh, I flipped on ESPN. Stephen A. Smith has a huge NBA brand, knows a lot about the NBA. I wanted to see how he reacted to Adrian Wojnarowski and Sham Sharnia's reporting about Emmy Aduko. And, and I wanted to see where this conversation was going to go. Uh, Emmy is a black coach. Uh, he's coaching the Boston Celtics. Uh, he's, you know, going into his second year. We're just a week away from NBA teams reporting to training camp. And he led his team to the NBA Finals a year ago. <sighs> My expectations have been so lowered that I knew this story would spin racial. Uh, it started spinning racial last night on social media, and, and Woj, I don't think, didn't tweet this out until like 1.35 a.m., and immediately the What About Brett Favre tweets started. And, and I'm like, well, hold on. An NBA coach is facing discipline for uh, uh, illicit or irresponsible or immoral relationship in his workplace environment. And somehow this has something to do with Brett Favre. That amazed me. And then this morning I watched First Take and Stephen A. Smith blew my mind. And so let's start there. Let's play some, there's I think two clips I wanna play of Stephen A. Smith. Let's play them back to back, both of them mind blowing to me. And I'm gonna take it a step further. I don't appreciate that being done to a brother because I got news for you, America. There's plenty of white folks in professional sports that's doing their thing. And I say that not complimentary. I don't see the information out about them. Why are we talking about this now? We got to talk about it because it's the news. Ain't none of our damn business unless you fire him. But if you keep him, it's none of our business. Mm -hmm. It should have never been. It should have never been put out there by the Celtics organization. And don't tell me you didn't do it because you absolutely did it because news reporters got it. So it emanated out of Boston. Somebody ain't in L.A. or Utah or something leaking this stuff about the Boston Celtics. Right. This is on y'all. You shouldn't have been out here. That's what I have to say. What I will say is this, and this is a message to the Boston Celtics. I got a problem with you as an organization right now. Because if you're not going to fire him, why the hell do we even know about this story? Nobody's bringing that up. I'm going to bring it up. What the hell are you telling us for? I've been covering the NBA for over a quarter century. And I'm trying to tell you right now, I can't count the amount of fraternization, mm -hmm. or dare I say more, that goes on 
in practically every damn organization within the National Basketball Association, the NFL, Major League Baseball, the list goes on and on. People get together, they working together. That stuff happens all the time. Literally, anybody that covers the professional sports will tell you. That is not new. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm bringing that up is not to excuse anything. Because if you're talking about, especially in, especially if it involves married folks and stuff like that, right. nobody condoning none of this stuff. That's not where I'm going here. Mm -hmm. The issue that I have with the Boston Celtics mm -hmm. is that if you're firing him, you wouldn't tell us why. So if you're going to retain him, why let us know now? Why I have a problem with an organization this is not about what transpired on the basketball court. This is not basketball decisions. If the reports say it's two consenting adults, and no matter how unfavorable mm -hmm. or egregious we may think their consensual behavior is, the fact of the matter is it's none of the public's damn business. Why do we know this? Because if it, if it were me and I'm standing in front of the Boston Celtics, you know, if you're Woj, Adrian Wojnarowski, our extraordinary insider who's been all over this story, along with Sean, Johnny and others, Johnny and others, I get it. What I'm saying is, why do we know this? Why is this publicized? This is a comical question. Coming from someone who purports to be a journalist or a journalist in his past. This is a comical question. Why do we know this? Because if, and, and, and first of all, we don't know it from the Boston Celtics. This all happened 1, 2, 3, 4 a.m. in the morning. This, to me, sounds like one of uh, Emmy's assistant coaches is friends with someone in the media, and they're gossiping about why they're not going to have their head coach next season or why he may get suspended. This isn't uh, Brad Stevens who's running the Boston Celtics or some high-end executive saying, hey, you know what, at four in the morning, we want to leak this out to Adrian and Shams. Th these are reporters doing their job, calling all of their sources, tr calling agents. Construct There's someone, Emmy, I'm sure he and his agent are pissed off. They may have leaked it. They may have told these guys. But, but even if we go a cut deeper about, let's say Boston did put this out, and let's say they do give an explanation today, tomorrow, whatever, what's going on with, with their head coach. If they don't give an explanation, they get crucified. You're going to suspend discipline your black head coach that just took your team to the NBA Finals and you're not going to give an explanation? If they do that, Stephen A. Smith and all the other race baiters go on TV and call Boston and the Celtics organization the most racist organization in sports. How dare they suspend Emmy Aduko without an explanation? This is racist. You can't do this. They better have a great explanation for why they're doing this and they better give it to us. That would be the argument. And so what has happened is guys like Stephen A. Smith, Shannon Sharp, other people, Twitter, th these guys all pander to Twitter. Twitter is so racialized and it's so trained everybody to look at every situation through a racial lens. No one looks at things. Again, we talk on this show constantly about looking at the world through a biblical lens, looking at the world through a more moral lens. Social media baits everyone. Every situation has to be examined through a racial lens. That's the game that the Boston Celtics and every sports franchise and every person in America is being forced to play. If Jason Whitlock goes outside and says, hey, it's hot today. People, well, first, people are going to say, well, well, hold on, Jason's black, and he thinks it's hot. And if you don't like black people, right, it must be cold. If a white person goes outside and says they think it's hot, we don't think, well, is he right or wrong? 
We start, we, we, we evaluate everything through race. This is crazy. It's self-destructive. It's toxic. It's, it's ruining our country. Stephen A. Smith, we just saw a, a couple of weeks ago, play the race card on BYU based on nothing. And that, that's what I tweeted out this morning. It's like, is Stephen A. a PSYOP? Is he an MK Ultra? Does, does he have some handler? Who's telling him to do this? To throw out all logic and common sense and just go on TV and play the race card. Is Disney telling them to do that? Is that what they want? Is everything evaluated through a racial lens? This coach allegedly, based off the reporting we, we, we've been told, is undisciplined sexually. He's in a relationship with Nia Long, some actress, and, and uh, you know, th there's reports that maybe this isn't his first rodeo with extracurricular activity uh, within the Boston organization. Perhaps uh, the Celtics have overreacted here because there is some truth to what uh, Stephen A. Smith is saying that in sports organizations, in any organization, in, in this co-ed work environment world that we have created, there's a lot of shenanigans going on. But perhaps, and again, there's a lot of things to discuss here, and we're going to try to discuss them, but there's a lot of things to discuss here. Perhaps this is actually a good thing. The Boston Celtics are taking a moral stand and perhaps they're trying to create a work environment where head coaches can't just indiscriminately screw their subordinates. Perhaps they're drawing a line in the sand because their organization may have been dealing with this problem in other areas and arenas and they had to draw a line in the sand because things were out of control. Who knows? But let's have that discussion before we go to playing the race card and, and, and oh, white guys are doing the same thing and no one's talking about it, go tell Rex Ryan that. You remember Rex Ryan? Nothing illegal. Stories about him and his foot fetish and what he and his wife like to do. Someone uh, texted me early this morning Stories of ESPN doing stories on white NBA executives getting fired for extracurricular sexual relationships in the workplace. These stories are being written about and talked about on ESPN. It's, I, and so I just want to start with, because there's a lot to unpack, Steve Kim's uh, joining us from LA. Uh, as I've already told you guys, Jill Savage is in studio. But Steve, I want to start here and Jill, and I'm going to throw it to you first, Steve. What's going on with Stephen A. Smith? This seems very odd in terms of the BYU thing. It seems like he's bending over backwards to bring up. He's turned into Bomani Jones, and he, I don't think he ever was Bomani Jones, but he, that's who he's turned into. What's going on? Well, first of all, though, uh, my thoughts and prayers are with Neil Long. And um, it, it proved Chris Rock right. A man is only as faithful as his options, okay? But as it relates to Stephen A. Smith, this is so predictable. Uh, it's almost on cue. It's basically like he's reading from a script. And as this story broke last night, and I sent it to you, Jason, and other people, uh, you could already see the racial lines being drawn in this story but again if stephen a smith and by the way i want to make this clear to a certain degree i actually agree with them this seems like a personal matter people and i'm not condoning it people cheat on their spouses all the time okay and what you do in the privacy of your own bedroom or hotel room is your business i really don't care however in a corporate workplace which the nba is it's just dressed up as sports but it is still a business there are clear rules and guidelines that are put into place. And obviously he broke them. <laughs> like R. Kelly, they didn't keep it on the down low enough. He's gonna have to deal with the ramifications. But I do have a question for Mr. Smith. If this was a white coach, 
would he be taking this stance? I'm, let's just be honest about it. And because it's interesting you brought up the BYU situation from a couple of weeks ago with the volleyball player. Did you know this past weekend, Jason, that a football recruit that was at the BYU-Oregon game actually left the game, a young high school recruit, in disgust because the student section or somewhere in that stadium, at Autzen Stadium, they were chanting, F the Mormons. And in fact, Dan Lanning had to come out and apologize. Now, I'd like to think, you know what, that's terrible behavior. I want to want to praise Dan Lanning for coming out and apologizing, but where's the uproar for that when it was clearly heard by, by thousands of other people? So, again, I'm just getting sick of the whole net. This is the new whataboutism card. But, but, but what about Brett Favre? What about him? He's probably going to go to jail, and he deserves it. But that's going to be the new thing now. If certain people get into trouble and individuals like you and other outlets cover a story – that's going to be the card they pull out in the back. But, 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 what about Favre? That's the new thing. Joe, you know, what is Stephen A. Smith, what is Disney, what is ESPN doing? It seems like they're trying to get ratings, and this is what they know will get them those, you know, everybody will be clicking on the Twitter stories, everybody will be watching these videos. But we are so far down this cultural path now where everything has to be racist. It's literally on both sides of the coin. It's racism. It's just coded in racism. And if you don't see that, then, then you can't you can't have an opinion on the story. It has to start there first. And it's so it's so annoying to see this because it feels like you're just being played. It doesn't feel like it's an honest reaction. Stephen A going, oh, as a brother, I, don't, I, I can't even take this story. No, if this was a white coach, you would, you'd be having different reactions to it. And I, I just want to judge people based on what they have actually done. And I, I look at what Stephen A is saying, and to the to the extent that Stephen, you, you have already said this, like, what is happening is a personal matter. But if they went out and fired him, this would be such a huge story. The, the first year head coach making it to the NBA Finals, one of the best teams last year from the All-Star break on, that defense going through. There's no question about it. Udoka was having a great first year as a head coach. So you can't just go out and fire the man and not say anything and expect this whole story to just go away. No, it's going to be in the news. That's what you that's the job, the position that you take as becoming a head coach, your life is going to be in the news. That's part of the job requirement now. And it's just it's so frustrating and and to go back to the the BYU story Where's Jay Billis? Where is Andy Katz? Right? We had they're they're still standing up for the volleyball player. There was nothing on tape. They went back and looked at the the Duke volleyball game against BYU. There was nothing there. Oregon, it's all over the broadcast. You could hear it. Every the head coach came out and apologized for it. Nobody is taking that seriously and making a big deal about it because it's not a special class. The Mormons aren't protected. They aren't viewed as a cool class. In this case, it, you just see, okay, we're, we're picking and choosing who we want to defend. And this case is just another one, another example of it. You said perhaps they're motivated by ratings. I, I don't believe that. I, I, I don't. Now, maybe there are some tweets that you can get out of this, but I don't think this leads to ratings. The people that cover sports media no longer write and talk about ratings. That's been forbidden, that's now off limits. If you follow it though, the, these shows, Stephen A. Smith's show does not get great ratings. It, and, and ESPN's ratings across the board are way down as people have cord cut and if people have walked away from the network. This, this kind of race baiting doesn't lead to ratings. I'm going to, Steve, I'm going to excite Exhibit A, Jamel Hill and Michael Smith. They had to move away from them because they, they helped wreck the 6 o'clock Sports Center brand and franchise and, and their whole little way of playing the race card. It did not work, and they moved away from it because the ratings are so bad. And, and no one right now believes 
playing the race card the way they're doing. Shannon Sharp does it over at Fox Sports. I'm t I follow the ratings. It does not work. It does not lead to additional viewers. It but does Jason. lead to more social media clout, but, but I don't think that's the, 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 the impetus or the motivation for television networks. I think chaos and, and just uh, stirring racial division is the actual motivation. I, th I don't think Stephen A. Smith authentically believes what he was talking about today. I don't think he authentically believed what he did about BYU. I think he's been given a mandate and others have been given a mandate, stir the racial pot, promote racial division, that's what you're getting paid for. No different than LeBron James, Colin Kaepernick, and the marching orders they got from Nike. Well, Jason, though, let's take a look at this. If you have the views that are much more conservative than Stephen A. or Jamel Hill, Will Kane and Kurt Schilling, because they had an opposing view, they had no future at the network. I believe Stephen A. Smith is very savvy. He understands what is accepted in terms of his messaging and what he promotes. Also, I, I go back to this. When Terrell Owens, of all people, questioned his street cred, because again, street cred is so important, right? It's like an Amex, right? Visa card. Um, and said, you're not as black as Max Kellerman. It, just my view. But from that point on, Stephen A. Smith said, oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I don't want anyone to question my quote unquote street cred because the reality is if he would have came out and let's say taken more or less our view or even close to it he would have gotten skewered that's the truth so a lot of these guys i don't think have the guts to tell the truth and that's the truth of the matter and, and now again the easy default position is to point to brett Favre, and so i don't see any of this changing look i'm not even surprised by the reaction it's almost like a WWE script. You know how it's going to play out. You know what's going to happen. And none of this is a surprise to me, Jason. Guys, I want to take care of a little business. I want to continue the conversation afterwards. I'm going to tell you where I disagree with you a bit, Steve, in terms of why the Celtics had to take action against Emmy Yuduko. Uh, but first, I want to take care of a little business. Uh, are you feeling just uh, like you can't get back in shape. It's not your fault, it happens to every man. As men age, our bodies naturally lose free testosterone. That's because when you're younger, you were at the peak of your testosterone production. Getting older makes it hard to stay in shape, but how would you like more energy to counter the negative physical effects of aging? Nugenics Total T Testosterone Booster is the number one selling testosterone booster at GNC. It will help you turn back the clock, re-energize your workouts, get you better results at the gym, and help you look and feel as good as I do. I looked at myself in the mirror today before the show and I said, I don't know if I can look any better. But you know why? It's because I'm getting back in shape and Nugenics and Total T can help you do that. I can look better and I will because I'm gonna keep taking this Total, Total T and keep working out and keep losing weight. Uh, but Total T uh, contains man-boosting key ingredients like testophen, which has been validated in five clinical studies shown to boost free testosterone levels in men. Because Nugenics Total T boosts free testosterone, that aging process, that the aging process robs you of, you'll feel stronger, leaner, with more energy and drive and more passion too. Your partner will notice the difference. Now get a complimentary bottle of Nugenics Total Tea when you text FEARLESS to 231-231. Text now and get a bottle of Nugenics Thermo, their most powerful fat incinerator ever, with key ingredients to help you get back into shape fast, absolutely free. Text FEARLESS to 231-231. That's FEARLESS to 231-231. Steve, I want to go back at, at you on a point you made or, or tell you why I think, and, and Jill, because I think Jill probably kind of sides with you like, hey, are, are the Celtics overreacting here? I don't think they are. In the new world that we live in, in, in I'll in the Me Too world that we live in, in the uh, feminist world that we live in. 
His behavior is putting that organization, allegedly, in a very vulnerable position with their female employees. Yeah. If the coach is running around, banging his subordinates, though it's my dad told me this when I was in college, and I'm gonna say it just how he said it. Uh, my dad owned a bar in the inner city, he had a very beautiful uh, barmaid named Debbie. And, and I hate to admit this, but you know, this is just, you know, when I was in college, when I was 22, 23, decided to talk to my dad, you know, dad, daddy, you, you hitting that? Debbie was beautiful. My dad was, my father was divorced at the time. And, <laughs> and he's like, no, I'm not. And I'm gonna tell you, he goes, I'm gonna tell you why. He goes, once you start screwing them, they don't work for you, you work for them. And that's the situation the Boston Celtics are trying to avoid. When your coach is betting an underling, she has so much leverage over him and the organization, particularly in this world, and the Celtics like they were tolerating or covering up for it, he, he, he makes them all vulnerable. He's at the top of the organization. He's not an assistant coach. He's not uh, an, an executive vice president. He's the head coach, other than Brad Stevens, and maybe has even more power than Brad Stevens. He, he's at the top of the food chain, and he's making the entire organization vulnerable. That woman could sue, or women could sue at any time. And, and now, it, it, it's no different than I, I, and I hate to use this example because I know the full details, but it, it's like what happened with Isaiah Thomas and the New York Knicks, mm. where Isaiah Thomas said something allegedly inappropriate to Anuka Brown Saunders or whatever her name was, and she sued Dan, uh, James Dolan, Dolan. And, and got a bunch of money from the Knicks over Isaiah saying allegedly the wrong thing to her. If this guy's, you know, dipping his stick somewhere and probably text messages and all kinds of things that could be turned against him at any time, I don't think Boston had any choice but to deal harshly with him. Jason, I actually don't disagree with you. I made it clear. This is the rules in a corporate setting. The rules are the rules. And there are standards. Um, the issue is, and again, so... Don't crap where you eat and don't uh hum where you work. That should be like the 11th and 12th commandment. Let's just carve that out in the stone tablet. But this is where I do feel bad and for the females. Now I'm seeing on social media pictures of all the Celtics female staffers and there's a lot of speculation. And I'm thinking, come on, folks. These are many of these women might be married with children. Why put them through that? And again, that's part of the ramifications of what you did. And, and, and it reminds me of one of my favorite songs from the mid 80s by the Timex Social Club, uh, Rumors. How do rumors get started? Started by the jealous people. And you're right, Jason, everything you outlined right there with just random females who just happen to be in that media guide are now being plastered all over saying, hey, was this part of the hit? You're right. That's exactly part of the reason why they had to deal with this. But I want to say this again for those like Stephen A. Smith. Who wanna, I don't want to say excuse Adoka, but want to lessen it. I'm going to say this again. I'm going to repeat it. The standards and expectations of the people that you have for them, that's what you think of them. So, Stephen, what do you really think of Adoka and a lot of other people in the NBA? Are your standards and expectations really that low? Well, I, I'll say this, his standard expectations are somewhat based off of what he's seen. And there, okay. again, when you're our age, Stephen A and I are around the same age, you've seen a lot of hanky-panky in sports organizations. And I've seen, I mean, I've seen a lot of hanky-panky. I, I, I've seen, you know, serious, serious domestic violence incidents not even involving players, involving coaches covered up by organizations. And, and w w what they end up trying to do, they'll place or try to pawn off a coach 
to another organization rather than de deal and discipline. And I think that's, that's what Stephen A's talking about. He's seen people remove behind the scenes in ways that, that never get out to the public. But that just can't happen with a head coach. And, and Joe, I, I, we'll get into this a little bit later when, when uh, Tiffany and Shamika are a part of the conversation. But I, I'm wondering how you feel as a woman. Have they overreacted here? Uh, you know, Rob, and again, the rumors are he's going to get a year long suspension. Adrian Wardenowski is saying it seems to be headed that direction. Shams tweeted that out originally last night. That's the same suspension as Robert Sarver. Is that fair? I was just going to bring that up. I think that the timeline of this happening has to be factored into this with Robert Sarver going in and saying, OK, you know, they, they might be forcing him to sell the team now. He definitely has a one year suspension. But looking at what he did and the NBA coming down on him the way that they did, they have to say, OK, we're, we're just either going to have morality back in the NBA as if it was back as if it was ever there to begin with. But I, I would like to see this if, if this is going to be the new precedent that they are going to set is that you can't go through. We're not going to stand up for any of this. But I think that this coming on the heels of Robert Sarver makes this a completely different story. If this happened a month, two months ago before this really came to fruition for, for Sarver and Phoenix, um, I feel like they, the NBA might have addressed this a little differently, that it might not have been a full season um, because it is a personal matter. I still, I still don't like to see it. You still don't want to have this happen. But a year for this feels a little bit lengthy when you look at something like a I Deshaun clarify, Watson though. And, I the, and the NFL. The NBA took action against Robert Sarver. This what is the we're team. hearing, this is the Boston Celtics. Right. Right. And again, I, I go to like, we don't know what's going on within that culture, the dynamics inside that organization that may, and, and I've heard rumors that this isn't his first rodeo. Mm -hmm. And, and I, 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 I just think in the current environment that we've got now with the, the racial conversation and all of that, I'm, people are going to get upset when I say this, but I, I could see Emmy and other black coaches that have had any modicum of success. I'm bulletproof. I'm absolutely bulletproof. Who, who can do anything to me? Who can put any restraints on me? I'm bulletproof. I'll play the race card on you, and if I won't, others will for, on my behalf, and that's what we're already seeing play out. And so I, I, I think for Emmy, it's unfair to him because he shouldn't be walking around feeling bulletproof, but I wouldn't blame him for feeling bulletproof, and I wouldn't blame any of these coaches for feeling bulletproof because that's the environment we've set up. There are no standards for you. There's nothing that can't be excused. And, and so when I, when I take a step back, and I can't wait to hear if there's other details that come out, I, I just tend to think they were having a hard time getting this guy to listen to anybody, and that's why the punishment seems so harsh. Steve? Jason, yeah, one, I want to wrap this up here, I, if you want, but how long before a media member compares this to the racist history of Boston when Bill Russell's house was broken into and they they, they smeared shit all over his wall. I, I'm gonna, I think by Friday, someone's gonna actually make that comparison and conflate that. One quick thing about Robert Sarver. Yeah, I, I guess he's gonna sell his team and I'm thinking, oh, this guy's gonna make a hundred millions of dollars. That's not much of a punishment. You know what I would've done, guys? Not to hijack this, but it's what I do. Um, so Robert Sarver owns the Suns and the Mercury, right? The WNBA team. I think a real punishment would have been to force him to own three more WNBA teams. Now, that's a penalty. Is he making himself, <laughs> he making himself a team for like uh, seven fifty million or whatever, for half a billion? It's not much of a punishment. But if you make him say, you know what? Okay, Sarver, we're sick of your sh You're going to own two more WNBA franchises? Let me just tell you something. That is like a death sentence. That's just my view of it. Well, first of all, he's going to sell the Phoenix Suns probably for close to $2 billion. Uh, and, and oh. you know, 
Now, he may lose a half billion on the sale uh, <laughs> when he has to throw in the WNBA team with it as well, but uh, he's going to make plenty of money uh, selling the Phoenix Suns. All right, thank you, Steve. Uh, appreciate it. Good job as always. Uh, you can email me and us at fearless at theblaze.com. Uh, Shamika Michelle, I'm Tiffany Olin. We all want to go to heaven with freedom. It's my obligation on hate discrimination, raising up your hands for freedom. All right, welcome back. Uh, we're going to expand our conversation a bit about Emmy Aduko, the uh, Celtics coach who's facing some disciplinary action for his extracurricular activity in the workplace. We're going to expand it by bringing Adam Levine, one of the singers, or is he the lead singer? Help me out from Maroon the 5. The lead singer. Yeah, he's been in the news cycle uh, for cheating on his wife. His mistress put out some videos and there's rumors that he wants to name his baby after his mistress. And uh, anyway, that made me want to talk with Jill and Tiffany and Shamika about men and whether women, uh, whether it's foolish or not for women to date celebrities, date and or marry celebrities. Uh, Shamika, we're going to let you go first. Uh, we'll, we'll just start there with just a very generic question. Foolish for women to date uh, celebrities? I don't think it's foolish for women to date celebrities. I do think, though, that you have to take in mind that um, anything that happens in your relationship a lot of times will make it to the news, and so you will have to deal with gossip and people talking about certain things. But I don't think that means you can't date a celebrity. But I also think that women should keep in mind it doesn't change the fact that you have an obligation to do certain things. And I think that women forget that. Sometimes they come to the table thinking a man is going to bow down and be faithful to them simply because they're a woman and that's it. They, they never ask the man how things are going in the relationship. They never want to know what he's missing or what he's uh, thinking, what he's unhappy about, and they fail. And I think that is whether you're a celebrity or not. I, I'm going to push back before I let Jill and Tiffany in. You really think that's what's leading Adam Levine? She's not checking to say, hey, what's going on, baby? You missing anything? Am I doing this or that right? You really think that's why he's got four or five mistresses now, or is he just, you know, a little selfish celebrity pig? I definitely think he can be a selfish celebrity pig. Like um, Steve Kim pointed out, you're only as faithful as your options. But I do think that women are very quick to say when they are unhappy with something, when they need something, but they're slow to hear and slow to listen when it's the man uh, saying the other thing. As society, we haven't provided a space for men to really say they're unhappy with a certain thing. And so a lot of times they sit quiet or if they say something, women are are attentive to just be able to read between the lines. I think that happens a lot in relationships, whether you're a celebrity or not. Mm. Uh, complaining, that's not my issue. I, I know how to complain. That's what I do for a living. <laughs> and it, foolish, uh, <laughs> foolish to date celebrities? I think you should know what you're getting into when you date a celebrity. Um, it's not easy to date a celebrity. The stigma that comes with them is usually true, the sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Um, they live a wild lifestyle. Women are thrown at them every day, which creates a world where it's easy for them to get into sex addiction. Mm. It's not an excuse, but I'm just saying it's their job is set up that way. Not just rock stars, football players, NBA, things, it's just given to them, thrown at them. So for a woman to date them, it's very, very hard. So does she have to put blinders on? I guess it's what you're willing to put up with. I'm not saying that you have to put blinders in. It comes down to your morals and standards. If you have certain things that you expect out of a relationship, maybe a celebrity is not for you. Jill? More money, more problems, Jason. <laughs> That's what we're coming down with. When you look at it, Tiffany alluded to it women throw themselves at men that are celebrities. Our culture has put them on such a pedestal, whether you're 
a musician, you're an actor, you're an athlete, you're a coach. Women constantly are going to be coming up to these guys. And yeah, you can say no once or twice, but you have to say no time after time after time again. It just lends itself to be a more difficult relationship. And you do see, you know, like celebrity couples that get together, they both have, a, a, you know, a similar adage on, on both sides that they both have to deal with that same thing. That might be a little different in my opinion, but when if it's just, you know, the man is the celebrity with women constantly throwing themselves at him, it's, it is, you know what you're getting into and it's, you know, give and take in a relationship. And I want to add this. Go ahead, please. Um, sometimes you don't know the behind the scenes of a relationship, what arrangement they might have. Right. Right. Maybe mm -hmm. Adam Levine's wife knows that he cheated. He cheated before, before her. Maybe she got him cheating. Maybe <laughs> she know? did. Maybe but she. Let me, yeah. I, I want to go ahead, Shamika. No, I was going to say to what Tiffany was saying, a lot of times you don't know what uh, they have set up in their relationship. And it is about what you're willing to put up with or what your deal breakers are. One of the things I liked about Monique, the comedian, is when she got with her husband, she let everybody know up front, our deal breakers are not me sleeping with somebody else or him sleeping with somebody else. So like, don't even bring that up. Don't bring it to us. It's not going to end our marriage. But there may be something else that's her deal breaker. Who knows? Leaving the toilet seat up. We don't know. But I think you have to understand what your deal breakers are in a relationship. And sometimes it, it may be that, you know, that's not a deal breaker. Let me throw this back at y'all. Uh, particularly Tiffany and Jill, but Shamika, you chime in after them. Y'all have basically argued, oh, the women are just throwing themselves at him. They're just throwing themselves at him. And I'm sitting there going, well, hold on. We're in this social media DM world where let's don't pretend like men ain't sliding into DMs out hunting and fishing. Uh, and so I don't think, you know, it's just Adam Levine, everywhere he walks, there's a pair of panties falling at his feet. Maybe he's hunting for those panties as well. Social media sets it up where it's easy for people to have affairs and cheat. There's vanishing mode. You can have a whole conversation and then take away your conversation. Snapchat, you can send a picture. No one know about it. They make it easy for people to be able to slide up in your DMs. I mean, as single women, Oh, there is a famous married man that I didn't know what vanishing was on Instagram until this guy was like, <laughs> and I was like, what, what is this? How did this just happen? No idea. Cause I don't, I don't look for ways to, Oh, how do I delete my messages? No, if I say it, I say it, but definitely a thing that, that men, so they're, they're looking. Yeah. D d Shamika, I'll let you jump in, but it's a two way street. Yes. Yeah. Definitely, it's a two-way street. I've had people slide into my DM a couple of blue checks. And let me tell you, when you have two phones, that vanishing thing doesn't mean anything because I think I'm just as important. And so I'm going to take one phone and snap pictures of the other phone because you're not getting ready to she to me. So <laughs> I want people to know that. It may vanish on your end, it ain't vanishing on mine. But yes, men do go after, and sometimes they're just being greedy. They may be intrigued for, for anything, the way that you think, the way that you look, and they just want to see what you got going on. So yeah, it definitely goes both ways. All right, let's get even broader. Uh, and Shamika, I'll let you go first. Unrealistic to expect monogamy from men. I don't think it's unrealistic. You know, I do know men that are monogamous and that are very faithful and who are good looking, attractive men that could get any woman that they want. So I don't think it's unrealistic at all. I think what's unrealistic is the expectations that you can be in a relationship and not have honest communication. I think that's where we fail as couples or, or, or as people. We don't honest be honest with, with each other. I saw a video the other day. There's this viral video of this young boy. He is missing his two front teeth and his mom is asking him what kind of woman that 
he wants. And so she goes through a series of questions and she's like, do you want a light woman or a dark woman? And he's like, I want a sexy chocolate woman like me, you know? And she goes, well, do you want her tall or short? And he was like, I want her shorter than me. Every man's woman is shorter than her. And she said, well, you want her skinny or thick or fat? And he said, I want her skinny. And so then she inserts herself into the uh, conversation and goes, you know, well, would you want somebody like your mom or you don't want somebody like me? You want them skinny? Like, am I too fat? And he eventually tells his mom, like, I love you. I, I, I love you, mom. But, you know, you you are getting kind of big, you know, you are you you are fat, but he, he coupled that constantly with I love you, mom, like I love you. And I think a lot of times we don't want to hear something hard, nor do we want to say something hard to the person that we love. We don't want to say something that's going to make us look um, ugly or look like we have a weakness or look like we have an issue with something. There's no space provided in the relationship to just be honest. And and keep it naked, as I say all the time. So I don't think that it's unrealistic that you can be monogamous. I think it's unrealistic that you can be in a relationship and not have a good uh, communication, not have strong lines of communication. Unre monogamy unrealistic for men? Um, I think it all is, sometimes it's how you're brought up. I was brought up that monogamy and cheating was wrong. But we're in a society where even TV shows today tell us it's okay. So also, when men can get it for free from women living in Nashville as an experience, why would they want to be monogamous? I mean, I don't know. I'm half and half with it. Huh. I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump in here. I'm not going to be a coward. I'll, I'll have an answer here <laughs> shortly. I still want to believe that monogamy is a real thing in the real world. Um, I would, I would love for that to be, you know, if that's what you want in your relationship, that that's what you get. It's not the way of the world. Uh, it's really funny because a guy that used to play in the NBA forever, I had this conversation with him and he's like, oh, monogamy. That's not even what men were brought up to do. If you go back from when they were, you know, out there and hunting and trying to gather all the stuff for the women, they had all these, all these women in, in, their, in their little tents and I'm like, we, we aren't doing that. Like we have cable TV. We're all sitting here like we cook in the kitchen like the chicken comes from the grocery store. Like this isn't that world. And he's like, but it's it's primal. It's in your head. It's in your blood. It's just what you do. And I was like, that's a very convenient excuse for somebody who grew up in a world where monogamy was not a thing, as we were talking earlier about the NBA. And I just look at that and say, I don't want that to be true. I want there to still be morals and values in this world. And I want desperately for that to just kind of take hold in society again. I, I, you know, five years ago, I certainly wouldn't be saying what I'm about to say now. Anybody can, uh, you know, I used to write columns, humorous columns, but they were all based in uh, disrespect for monogamy. Uh, I used to, I, I had a very famous column. Anybody that's been following me for a long time, uh, I used to write this column called Pussy Galore, uh, make the James Bond character, but it was my way of, you know, uh, very, I started, anybody ever heard the saying, uh, is undefeated? I kind of, in the sports world, I kind of popularized that. And, and, and that was, it was the Tiger Woods stuff, and just any time an athlete, back when these ESPN people would get in trouble, I'd say, oh, there goes Lore again, she's undefeated, you know, been taking down men forever. And, and so I used to think much, much differently about monogamy. And, and now I feel like I have an understanding of the importance of monogamy. And that's why I, I sit there as frustrated as I am with the world, I know that it's the failure of men that have caused all the chaos that we're living with now. And part of it's some of it is related to our lack of sexual discipline, uh, our lack of monogamy, uh, the one why women are to me going against their nature in an attempt to be more like men. And women are now disavowing monogamy, and, and we're looking around and 
No one really cares about the family, kids. No one really keeps their word. Because again, if you'll stand before God and your entire family and take a sacred covenant with God about how you're gonna treat a woman and then you immediately disavow it and start doing whatever you want, why would you expect anybody to live up to their word? And, and we live in a society now where there are no sacred covenants. There, a, a man's word isn't a man's word. If anybody, uh, and, and that's where I'm weird, uh, because again, I take my word very seriously, and when people don't, I get very upset, and it's part of, again, I was in the wrong mindset, I didn't believe in monogamy, and so I was like, I'll never get married, I'll never, I, I'll, I destroyed relationships to avoid marriage, because it's like, I'm not gonna lie to somebody, I'm not gonna, and I wish I was in a different mindset, but I, I think a lot of the issues we, we have in this society, it's just because men don't care about their word. And, and I, I can look around and be mad at everybody else, but I gotta be mad at myself first and what we've done uh, through our lack of discipline and lack of commitment to our sacred covenant. So uh, <clears throat> let me ask you ladies this, Tiffany, I'll start with you. And one, I think this will be interesting, you work uh, in a bar in, uh, in the entertainment industry here in Nashville. Do you think workplace environments are improving for women? No, I mean, there's no consequences for dating in the workplace. Um, me, I would never date someone in the workplace because I was raised, you don't date someone in the workplace. If you do, you're gonna lose your job. But a lot of people don't, are not grounded with morals and I see people dating multiple employees, not, none of them knowing about each other, and then they get a slap on the wrist. So I don't think it's improving. So take the sexual dynamics out of it. Do you think over the course of your work life, are women treated better in the workplace? Let's take the sexual dynamics out. Is I do think they're treated better because I have been in work environments where I have felt uncomfortable or been harassed by someone above me. If I didn't do certain things, I wouldn't get these shifts or I wouldn't, you know, and of course I never acted on them, I reported them. Um, but now you don't see that as much because you have HR, you have people to go to. So I guess it has improved in that sense. I look at the Harvey Weinstein dynamic and you go kind of before that and after that. And I know it's all wrapped up in the Me Too movement, but my first boss, the guys that used to host the radio show knew of my boss. They weren't, it wasn't his, their direct boss, uh, but they would always make jokes about like, oh, Dave in that casting couch over there, just watch out, right? It was just something that people could throw about, like if you're trying to get a job in the entertainment industry that, you know, sometimes this is what you're gonna have to do. I never did, by the way, just to throw that out there. Um, but I do think that things are improving if only because people are going to be frightened for losing their job if they do or say something wrong. Is there some middle ground that we might be able to just like live in and just kind of all be and, and not have to worry about every little thing that we say or if, oh, I compliment you on your jacket today, is that gonna be workplace harassment? Because some people, some women are like, oh, you can't comment on, on what I wear. That, you know, I'm gonna take you to my superior. You know, like there's, there's a fine line that, that we can settle upon. But I think that if you look back from the Mad Men era, Harvey Weinstein, to where we are now, it's a lot better now than it was back then. Shamika, things improving for women in the workplace? I, uh, maybe, uh, there's part of me that feels like things have gotten a little boring in the workplace. I know I got a $4 an hour raise because my boss, you know, had a thing for me. That worked in my favor. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I don't know, it's gotten a little bit boring now because I think men are so on guard that 
they don't even want to have regular relationships because of the way that it could look, the way somebody may think something is going on when there's nothing going on. And I think it's kind of just taking some of the playful banter out between men and women that just sometimes make life fun. Of course, no one wants to be in a position where somebody is holding something over their head as far as keeping them from elevating or succeeding or going to the next level. And that goes both ways. You don't you you don't ever want to be in a position as a man where a woman can hold something over your head to keep you from advancing and vice versa. One of the things uh, one of my former bosses told me is something a man should never do at work. You don't play with the money or the honey. Don't don't play with money when it comes to your work and don't get involved with a female because that can always lead to your downfall. But I think now people are just so on guard that we don't really have genuine relationships. We don't joke as much as we used to. Men feel like they can't compliment a woman. A woman feels like she can't compliment a man. And so I think that some of the, what we are dealing with now is just real boring a lot of times for me. Like I'm a joke a joking person like I like to make jokes and sometimes they're very you know crude and I just think that people are now just on guard so much not that you Shamika you don't crack crude <laughs> jokes I've never yeah, seen that I know it's hard to believe <laughs> <laughs> but you know um there was something wait I'm sorry Jason there was something you said no go ahead that you was talking about galore something that i grew up with was uh willie d saying um you think he's made a go well it's not you can't get a dime for it at the pawn shop so i think i've always been the type of person where i understood that it's not just about sex like you have to bring other things to a relationship and so when it comes to you know people cheating and 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 all of that it's not always just about sex. And that's where I think the communication comes in. I also want to say in defense of this coach um, for people saying, oh, he cheated on Neil Long. He cheated on his girlfriend. That was not his wife. And I personally believe if you don't take your relationship seriously, why should anybody else? So that's my thought on the coach who was not actually married. You know, you fair game if there's no uh ring involved you're just a glorified girlfriend i don't care that they call you a fiance uh shamika i'm gonna send this next question to you this will be our final one and and then we'll hear from jill and tiffany is a co-ed work environment is that ideal and i asked the question because i i think Co I will get myself into trouble, but I think co-ed work environments are extremely complicated and scary and not as productive as some of the previous work environments that we had. I think once you drop a woman into a uh, work environment with a bunch of men, particularly heterosexual men, everything changes. And, and so I don't, and again, I don't think it's ideal. Obviously, I, I move past my bias and I work with women and try to create a professional environment. Let me enter that into the record. It, it's not stopping me from hiring anybody or wanting to work with people, but I don't think it's ideal. Your, your, your thoughts? I prefer a co-ed work environment. Um, I would prefer to be around more men than a bunch of women. Um, uh, so I prefer that. I don't even remember an environment where I was just around mostly women, unless you want to say church, because, <laughs> you know, there's not a lot of men in, in church now. But um, I prefer a co-ed environment, I think, because it gives you the opportunity to not just have that interaction with a, a man, but to learn from people. One of the things I can say that I've learned from even just the men on our platform, seeing the with his wife, seeing you run a, um, your show and run a business and watching Steve Kim be able to laugh at jokes and be relaxed, listening to Royce be able to have an intellectual conversation. Like I've learned so much being around 
you men that I wouldn't want to lose that. I do a podcast with two men. And so I've, I've learned so much. And so if I, if you took that away from me, I think that I would be missing something. There would certainly be a gap in my life. So I'm in favor of co-ed uh, relationships or co-ed workplaces simply because you get to learn from people. I think you just have to know what is uh, okay and what's not okay. Um, I will say that the first time I met you, Jason, you came in, you 6'6". Six, six. I gave you a second look. You had that earring in your ear, but I knew I better not say anything because I didn't know how you would take it. You never know just how people are and, you know, whether they're uncomfortable with something, whether they're okay or they're relaxed or if they're fun, you know, and I just think you have to know what those boundaries are and you know, once you kind of build a rapport with people, you kind of know that. And so I, I love working with men and women. All right. Before you guys respond and Shamika, I may let you jump back in here. I, I, I want to add my. I just have a fear because I've, I've worked long enough uh, to have been in some different situations with female employees. And so I'm very guarded in the workplace. And, and, and I'm also, I can be as crude as Shamika, probably more crude. I, I grew up listening to Richard Pryor albums and that's where my sense of humor goes. And, and uh, again, I'm sitting here telling you, I used to write columns about pussy galore and all this other stuff. And as a columnist, that's where I grew up writing. That's a solo act. That's just me. And, and then as it relates to uh, when I started going into sports talk radio, that was me working with a bunch of guys for the most part back in the 90s and 2000s. And, <clears throat> and so I'm, I get quiet and defensive and a little bit aloof because it's like, if I let my full personality out here, I'm probably gonna get in trouble. And so I just tend to hold back uh, because I just, I've just seen too much and experienced too much that I'm, I'm halfway scared half the time. It's been great working with you all. I feel like I can be myself, but I just, I wanted to throw that out there and give you all the opportunity to wanna hear your opinions, but also wanna say, if you want to ask me anything or push back against anything I've said, maybe what I'm saying sounds absolutely stupid and I sound like a parent, feel free to say any of that. I see where you're coming from, but I, I also, I mainly agree with Shamika. I can't imagine not being in a co-ed work environment. I learned so much from men. I'm a guy's girl. I like to be around guys. I learn um, lots of things that not all women can, t I mean, you know I, know, I know a lot of women stuff, but being around a guy, you just learn a lot more. Um, how do you feel, like to say? I have never known anything other than a male dominated industry coming up through sports television for 13 years or whatever it was. Um, I would be in studio, you know, just day in and day out, and then eventually started traveling for games and, and being on the road. And that was our, our football crew. We would have the same crew every weekend, and we would all, you know, I was the only female on one of those crews. There was another female on a different crew that I worked on. Um, but, but for the most part, it was just me the whole time. And I feel like I've always been one of the guys, so I was never uncomfortable in that environment. Um, but I, I never, I never gave it another thought because that's the job that I wanted to do. I knew that going in and that's just what was going to be done. So Jill, what, and I'm sorry, Tiffany. Also, I think when you get too many women together and if it was all women, it would not be a good environment. <laughs> so for me, and I really want to hear Jill's perspective on this, what I, I've said and argued on this show that the injection of women into the sports talk lane, to me, I feel has softened the conversation. Now, people are sitting on shows and next thing you know, you gotta deal with a woman's sensibilities. And I've, I've been on shows and watched people on shows. The women are waiting. Michelle Beadle used to do this to guys all the time. She'd pounce if there was a chance to make them look sexist and she could go viral for calling out Stephen A. Smith or whatever, or whomever, to make them look set. And so 
I've been on shows where guys hold back and don't say what they really think because there's a woman in the conversation and he's scared to death that if he says the wrong thing, she's gonna come back and, well, you're sexist and blah, 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 and that's gonna go viral. And, and I, I've, I've also seen like football shows. This is what frustrates me, football shows. And I'm sorry if it makes me look bad, but I've, I've, I have never met a woman that knows football as well as I do. Met a lot of men that know it better than me. And I see uh, conversations when Samantha Ponder's hosting an NFL show with a bunch of NFL players and coaches, I look at the conversation as compromised because it's got to stay at a level where she can engage. And if it ever got to its deepest level, she, she has nothing to offer or maybe can't follow, can't hear what's being said that's interesting that needs to be probed. And so I'm not trying to put you in a spot, but uh, I, sports, locker room conversations, the way guys talk, we call each other names, we say semi-disrespectful things to each other, no harm, no foul. But when I look now and say, well, we've injected women into the sports talk space virtually everywhere, that's why I keep seeing men on TV crying and giving into their emotions and pretending like their feelings are hurt, where they would have never done that if there was no woman on set or the whole conversation hasn't been turned into an emotional conversation. I've said a mouthful. That's, it's really interesting because I think that it, it doesn't just speak for the sports environment, but we've made it out to be bad to be masculine and toxic masculinity. And everything has been feminized, whether it's sports talk or just your local news in just daily life. Um, I, I do think it's, it's interesting, you know, Sam Ponder coming in for Chris Berman, and that was a huge shift for ESPN. And then you look at the Fox pregame show, Carissa Thompson hosts the first show, yep. but Kurt Menefee gets that second show and it's all guys there. When you get to that final hour right before the games, it's all men and they all know, you know, the ins and outs, you know, most of them have the, the Hall of Fame jackets there. I, I'm, I'm going to say this. And Please, God, Kurt Menefee, don't be offended. I'm not sure if Kurt Menefee knows more about football than Carissa Thompson. Uh, so okay. I'm not sure if there's much of a difference there. And I, I don't say that to, I'm saying that one, to credit Carissa Thompson. Two, I'm not trying to denigrate Kurt Menefee, but he's not a former player. He's just a broadcaster and a host. But, but I, I've, I, I've, because looks matter so much more for women. Uh, and so we're really not talking about a group of tomboys that played sports hardcore, uh, I don't think for the most part. Sam Ponder was though. Or, yeah, she grew up, she didn't have TV. She was just a tomboy her whole life growing up and literally was like, oh, I think I'm gonna go do this TV thing. She didn't know any, I mean, she didn't have a TV in her house gotcha. when she was growing up. Gotcha. Her husband's a former right. NFL quarterback, so she probably knows more than most. But when I watch that show, I, I, it's, it's limited where it can go conversation-wise. Uh, but, but more than anything, it's almost like in the sports world, I wish there were more, like take Megyn Kelly in the political space. She's fearless and she can have any conversation that a man will have in the political space, no harm, no foul. And again, it probably took some time for her to get there to where she's that kind of fearless, but it seems like in the sports world, it's so woke and so given to emotion that there's, there's just not enough of that or that, that doesn't. Cassidy Hubbard is someone that I think is awesome. And to me, should be one of the top people at ESPN talking the NBA. I think she knows it forward and backwards. I think she's got kind of tough enough skin that she can get in there. But that's not who gets the main gigs. Uh, and, and, you know, you know I will get called uh, anti-black for saying, Malika Andrews, this is a little child that didn't pay any dues, that they've put on there because she looks good. 
Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm off on a tangent, and I probably got myself into a bunch of trouble. <laughs> Did you have some? Shamika, you got anything else you want to add? No, I was just going to say that goes, uh, you know, with you saying um, how sports, you can't say exactly what you want to say. I think that goes to just me and being on guard as much. I'm sure some of these women, not all, of course, you could say some of the same things and they wouldn't be offended. But now society is just, as Jill was saying, we're, we're all on this whole toxic masculinity thing that people are just afraid to be themselves. Like men are afraid to be who they are because you don't know if you're going to run into this woman that's going to laugh or if she's going to run to Twitter and say, this is how he made me feel uncomfortable. So I definitely get why men are on guard. I definitely understand why men won't really be who they are around a group of women because you just don't know at this point in life because now people are just so quick to want a story, so quick to want to, you know, get 15 minutes of fame from dragging somebody else down. You just don't know who to trust. So I definitely understand why it's that way. I, I'm not going to put a name to this next comment, but people will know who or kind of what I'm talking about. But I don't want to put a name because I don't want to think it's people's personal. But what drives me crazy is for I've been on Twitter since 2009. People have been criticizing me on Twitter and saying very mean, vicious things to me on Twitter since 2009. I don't care. I see too many female broadcasters who nail themselves to a cross and say, oh, this, t these tweets, these emails I got. And that's what drives me crazy. And, pe and I see guys get on shows and have conversations where they don't want to put themselves in those crosshairs of, of, of ever getting accused of putting someone in a spot where they may get negative tweets and emails. And, and maybe there are men just as soft and who whine and cry about the tweets and emails they get. But that's what drives me crazy. And so, Jill, you having pivoted over into the political space, I would imagine you get a lot of neg but, but my argument to everybody, like, that's the price of admission. Exactly. That, that's the ante. This is one of the first things that I tell young females that they come up to me and they say, okay, if I want to get in, if it was sports or politics or just TV in general, I say, okay, well, you better have a thick skin because this comes with the job. It's just part of our society. Twitter, it's, it's so easy for them to message you. Half the time you don't even have to put your real name on your account so they can just sit, you know, and type and it, it makes it so easy that something that they would never say to your face is something that they have no problem just, oh, send, you know, and, and you look at it and it, it makes just for an interesting arena to be, to be working in. Uh, but that's, it's all part of the game, right? Like this, this is what you sign up for. If you're a celebrity, there is something that goes along with your, your life is going to be in the public image. If you're on TV, people are just going to be tweeting at you. It's, it's the give and take. It's the choices that we make in life. So I'm going to end on this note. I, I just wish that people like yourself, Jill, Shamika, Megan Kelly, and maybe y'all do do this, but just like if I saw a guy crying about tweets and emails and he's a journalist, I, hey man, you ain't tough enough for this. Go, go fix burgers at McDonald's, go into insurance, go into accounting. You're not tough enough for public discourse and to be a public intellectual and to be a pundit, so go away. That's, that's the message I think any man would get. We don't seem to be giving that to women. We, 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 I've seen videos of, oh my God, let's read the mean tweets that such and such got. <laughs> I'm just gonna I play a violin and say it. Yeah, huh? we, do, we do on here. I think we really tell them how silly they look when they do it. I have a question for Jill though. I wanna know, have you gotten in any locker rooms? And is there anything that you saw that we might can discuss offline? <laughs> <laughs> plenty, uh, plenty back back in the day. 
We'll All talk right. about bring it. Back, bring back masculinity, though. That's the, <laughs> that's the blanket statement. We will be a better world with more masculinity, with the men being masculine, not the women. All right, Keep great that. job, ladies. Appreciate it. <laughs> awesome. Uh, get your Fearless Army swag at ShopBlaze Media slash Fearless. Delano Squires. Next. We want freedom. I just want, I want to be, I just All right, welcome back. Uh, let's go out to Washington, D.C., bring in our main man, Delano Squires. You know what I want, D? I want a more biblical take and perspective on this Emmy Aduko situation, uh, Adam Levine, and men. And so that's why we're ending the show with the smartest man on the show and one of the most <laughs> biblically sound people uh, on our show and maybe in America. And so, uh, D, I, I, I'm going to start here with the Celtics and the decision they potentially are going to make to discipline Emi Aduko for, you know, having some kind of inappropriate sexual relationship with a subordinate uh, with the Celtics. There's a lot of people that just kind of want to blow this off. Man, this goes on in sports. This goes on in corporate America. Why are they dealing so harshly with a successful head coach? The Celtics seem to be taking a little bit of a moral stand here and holding the line on a company policy. Uh, do you respect the Celtics for doing this? So, Jason, it's hard to, to put all of this in context until we have the full set of details, right? Um, when, when it first came out, I think the way that, that it, it leaked or the way that it came out, I first saw it from um, Adrian Wojnarowski. It was very vague and it said, you know, some offense that he didn't name. And then, you know, people started to speculate on who the person could be. And, and one woman's name, a VP, um, ended up getting dragged into this. And, and one ESPN reporter said that it's not her. So uh, un, until we get a better sense of what the actual offense was, right? So, for instance, it could be that, as you said, he, he had a, a consensual sexual relationship with a subordinate. They were dating. They they felt fine about it. People got wind of it. Felt, you know, that that she was getting preferential treatment. Um, and 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 I'm not even trying to be funny. I feel like I've seen she. So I'm I'm going with that assumption. So put that put that pin where it is. Um, that's one thing. But but let's say that it was a woman who was married, right? And let's say her husband worked for the Celtics, and he ended up getting fired, and. Or, or they engaged in certain types of conduct in, at the facility. Um, you know, they, they were being sloppy, quote unquote, in terms of how they managed their relationship um, around around the team. That may mean something very different for the, for the franchise. So, generally speaking, do I think that um, a, adultery is a sin? Obviously, yes. Right, as is fornication. Um, do I think that NBA teams typically um, take such a strong moral stance for just that infraction? Nah, some tells me there's something more to the story. Um, unless the Celtics want to take the lead and say, we as a franchise take um, you know, power dynamics seriously when it comes to uh, staff and subordinates, coaches and players and, and you know, members of the team. And we want to show, you know, how much of a, a welcoming, inclusive environment that we want to make, particularly for women who want to to have jobs in the NBA. And by doing that, we are willing to severely punish, you know, one of the up and coming coaches in the league. Um, I could see that position because that position will be motivated by, again, a, a sense of promoting, you know, diversity, equity and inclusion. But again, something feels like there's there's some details missing that I would like to come out. I feel pretty confident based off of two or three uh, people in the know that I've talked to. That there are reports that this involves the wife of a high-end executive mm. and that 
that the executive is irate, and some of it seems, this is where I get a little squirrely because they're saying that executive is insisting on uh, the, the lengthy suspension, but I don't see any executive other than Brad Stevens having the kind of clout to do that to the head coach that just led you to the NBA Finals. And so there, there's, but I could see uh, if, if, and again, I've heard from people that are in the know, this isn't a first time offense. And so, mm. you know, I, 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 and again, he's only been there a year. And, and I said earlier in the show, and, and I want to ask you this, I, I said, we've created such an environment of interpreting everything through this racial lens and anything that happens in the world, we immediately go to race. And, and so if, if that's the case, if that's the, the standard, mm. I can see why uh, the Celtics feel boxed in here a bit because if, if they don't if they don't leak out or put the information out, they're go, they're, they're going to get crucified either way it goes. And so the the way this conversation has been racialized and the way that I think the whole world has been racialized, I could see guys like Emmy Aduko, and I said this earlier in the show, feeling bulletproof that hmm. he's untouchable because any action he takes will be defended and the organization, particularly residing in Boston, and the way everybody loves to say, oh, well, Boston's the most racist place in the world, and uh, that I could see him feeling bulletproof. And, and so when I am trying to understand what's going on here, I think this is an employee, a successful one, that they've lost control of. Mm. And that's part of the reason the discipline is so harsh. So, so Jason, I hadn't heard those other details. And again, if those things are true, then that does, you know, bring some more texture to the story. And that would make sense because uh, no man wants to be cuckolded by another man, right? And when you have to look at the guy who's sleeping with your wife every day, you come through the doors at the facility, he's smiling in your face because he thinks that you don't know. But, but you know, because you got a private investigator and you know that he's been catting around with your wife. No guy likes that. And, and in some respects, in, 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 in terms of uh, the sports world, a one year suspension is more merciful than an outright termination. And depending on who this executive is, again, assuming this is true and wh what type of juice he has, um, uh, basically being blackballed from the league because in Proverbs where it talks about, you know, the sin of adultery, the writer of the Proverbs says, look, you can't take, uh, you know, uh, burning coals in, in, into your chest, into your bosom and expect not to be burned. Right. So in biblical times, you sleep with a man's wife, he may kill you. So so getting a one year suspension is is better than sort of the death sentence, uh, so to speak. Um, as it relates to, to Odoko's, uh, you know, coaching career. Now, that being said, he may just be the type of guy who's sloppy and can't, you know, he can't handle himself, right? He's, he's a very successful coach, obviously, in terms of his one year. He, he took over a very good program. He took him to the finals. He's a good-looking guy. He, he's been in a relationship with Nia Long for a number of years. So, you know, a lot of people, men and women for that, for that matter, are, are envious of him. So you probably figure, look, I have access to whoever and whatever I want in this facility. But every once in a while, life will give you a gut check. And, and you may, Jason, you remember, you remember the video uh, down low with R. Kelly, right? Mr. Big, let R. Kelly watch, drive around his wife, watch over his wife. And Mr. Big didn't live in Dahomey, so he didn't require all the men around him to be eunuchs. R. Kelly sleep with his wife. And what did Mr. Big do? He put the hammer on him, right? Left him unrecognizable. And, and, and typically, that's, that's what will happen if you, if you sleep with the wife of a powerful man. So a one-year suspension in that context may not be that bad for, for, this, for, this, uh, for this coach, but it, it's a bad look all around. And 
Jason, I want to echo your sentiment. The way that this has been racialized, and I, I was on Twitter earlier, I saw Stephen A. Smith, I saw Robert Griffin the th- third, I saw a, a lot of the, the dimmer lights in sports media and corporate press opining on this, and you know where they're going to go. Oh, why, why didn't you talk about Brett Favre? Why isn't ESPN covering Brett Favre? Um, because to your point, everything for them is racial, right? Now, if this had been a white coach, let's say, and a, and a black subordinate, then it's power dynamics, and then they, they're they going to be quoting roots and saying that white men have been having access to black women since the plantation, and so on and so on and so forth. So this is what happens when when you cast off scripture as, as your moral compass, and all, the only thing you think about is, well, what role did the white man play? What role did the black man play? And then you sort of formulate your response based on that. So um, I even responded to a tweet from Robert Griffin III because he said, if, if, you, if you are spending more time worrying about this than Brett Favre stealing $5 million from Mississippi, then you're part of the problem. And my thing is, if you spend more time on both of these than the fact that a, a Super Bowl champion and former pro bowler was ale- allegedly started a fight that got a man killed in front of his wife and his child, that your moral compass needs some serious recalibration. And, and, and that is uh, what I would use to describe ESPN. If it has any racial angle, they are on it like, like a dog on a bone. But if, if it's not one that they can play up, then they have no interest in it. And so this whole thing, this habit that ESPN and other media outlets are promoting to just look at the world through race goggles, this is what's so frustrating to me because this does not work for black people, the great mm. mass of them. This racial lens that they've got everybody tuned to works for racial elites. They use it for black elites. They Uh use it to improve their position in corporate America. Uh Oh, we're gonna hire some more diversity, inclusion, and equity executives, and we're going to hire uh, more black head coaches. And again, they all believe in this trickle-down racial justice deal that never trickles down to the great mass. It, it benefits the elite and no one else. And that's why, this is what's so frustrating, it's like we've moved completely away from analyzing any situation through a biblical lens and everything is interpreted through a racial lens. And that's, we're trying to obviously push back against that on this show. And it's the reason this approach, our approach works or why we do it is because that lens works for everybody. And that right. does Christianity, a biblical worldview actually does trickle down and benefit the poorest of the poor. Uh, you know, whereas this little race game that they're playing benefits a handful of people like Stephen A. Smith, who's making $13 million a year. It's going to benefit Emmy Aduko, I guess. He probably makes 4 or $5 million a year. But it doesn't work for anybody else. It's completely unhealthy. It's driving a wedge in this country. You can't get to the facts. You can't deal with the facts. You can't. Mm. It's corrupted the entire conversation and has everybody at each other's throats. That's what's frustrating me. Absolutely, Jason. Um, it, as you said, it, it has really negative side effects for the black masses. One, it encourages us not to take responsibility for our own behavior, right? We're, we're always, our first move is to always look, well, why, why didn't you do it to the white person? All right, it's never, you know what? Yeah, I shouldn't have done that. I was wrong for that. Let me, let me try to make amends. It's, it's always a, a comparison trap between us and white people. But, but you're right. One of the things, and I, I tweeted this earlier in the morning, uh, I have the type of job now where I could tweet during the day and not after 5 o'clock like Fred Flintstone. But um, I tweeted this earlier in the morning on a, on a tweet that uh, Stacey Abrams sent out. You know, she's running for the governor of Georgia, and as, as is the case with all Democrats, she talks a lot about abortion, and she, she links it to black women, particularly low-income black women. And I said that the aristocracy, the black elite, the talented tenth, right, the black leadership class, as you as you mentioned, um, they are the biggest impediment to progress, social, economic, spiritual progress in the black community. 
because they, they reject the, the power of agency. Um, they promote abortion as a moral good. Um, they diminish the importance of the nuclear family, right? They encourage government dependency. They abet lawlessness. And they bastardize the faith of, of our forebears. Um, and, and these people at the top use the plight of the black poor to extract benefits for themselves and much of the black middle class. So our, our Negro elite really are the culture vultures, right? And that's why um, I think it was USA Today had put out an article earlier this year where they said two years after George Floyd's death, many companies promised you know, more diversity in the C-suite and, and black women haven't realized that diversity. And I said to myself, what does George Floyd dying on a street in Minneapolis have to do with some black women who went to Harvard, you know, getting promoted to VP of her law firm? But this is how they think, right? They, they pick at the carcasses, particularly the black poor. They use anything that they can get their hands on that has a racial element to, to, um, to, to hold hostage the guilty white folks who they say hold all the power. So George Floyd gets killed, you gotta give me the day off because I'm, I'm, I'm stressed about it. I live in California, he was in Minneapolis, but I'm so stressed you have to give me the day off. Or you have to donate to my organization. Or you have to hire me as a DEI consultant, right? And, and let's, be, let's be honest, Jason, the people largely pushing this, not exclusively, are, are black women, educated black women. The DEI industry at least f just from my first glance, I'd say is at least 75% black women. Every other woman, some of them I went to school with, is diversity this, equity that, inclusion this, right? And some of it, uh, let, let's say some of it is, is useful stuff, right? They're, they're trying to broaden the net, reach a talent pool that, that may not be um, reached otherwise, but, but a lot of it is about extortion, extorting companies, extorting brands, um, and they and they use the plight of the black poor to do that. And this is why um, these people, the Stephen A. Smiths, the Jamel Hills, the Shannon Sharps, all of them, all of that, the members of the Afrostocracy will jump up in the middle of the night at a fake hate crime, right? And even defend it even after it's been proven to be fake. But when it comes to real street crime in the cities that the very cities that they live in, completely silent. It's, you, you make an excellent point. The, the, the other reason I wanted to bring you on is to talk about the monogamy angle. I just talked with mm. Jill and Tiffany and Shamika about this, and I asked them the question, and I wanted to ask you, is it unrealistic to expect monogamy from men? That's a great question. Um, is it unrealistic? For, for some men, it seems that way. Uh, I know multiple women, personally, who've told me that they've never known a man, any man in their life, who did not cheat on his wife. Um, so I, I could see why some women believe that. Uh, Jason, given our fallen nature, our sinful nature, um, and man's sort of basis proclivities, particularly as it relates to, to sex and sexual immorality, um, absent a man dedicating his life um, to Christ or, or, or some other uh, religion that has strict you know, prohibitions on, on adultery, I'm not putting my money on it, to tell you the truth. So I can speak for myself. I can, I can speak somewhat to the guys that I know personally. Any other, any other dude, if you ask me, would you put the deed on your house up you know, and bet that this man has been faithful to his life for his entire life, I'm not doing it. Now, is that a sad commentary on men? Yes, and it's an acknowledgement of our sinful nature. Um, but I think monogamy is possible, right? And I think it's a good thing. I think it's good for men, women, and children. Um, because again, when you, particularly when you're married, and I, and I don't think that Udoku is married to Nia Long. I think they're in a long-term relationship. I don't think that they're married yeah. legally. Um, well, put that aside, um, when, when you're a person, man or woman, husband or wife, and you invite a third party into your, your marriage, into your marriage bed, 
um, you're going to bring serious, serious problems into your relationship. And, and it's going to take time to not just get that person out of there, but to get that distrust out of there. Um, and sometimes that takes years. And sometimes it's a lifetime. So it's, it's not something I think guys should play around with. If you commit to one woman um, in front of friends and family and God, honor that commitment um, because I think you know, th those commitments are, 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 are worth making and keeping. And particularly if, if you're a Christian man, um, that should be the expectation that you will be faithful to your wife. But you and I both know, e even among clergy members, I mean, th this, there's some guys, and I've, I've named them before, so I'm not going to say their names now. There's some guys, I've said this before, I wouldn't even let my great-grandmother spend more than a day around some of these guys. Pr preachers, I'm talking about. Um, because... They, they have never shown a willingness, desire, or ability uh, to keep their hands off of any woman uh, for any extended period of time. You know, one th by eliminating any discussion of a biblical worldview, we never even get to have a discussion in society about the benefits of monogamy. Mm -hmm. and everything, the whole world, and I used to be of this mindset that the more the better, and mm. the more you have, the more masculine you are. And it, you know, I'm ashamed of myself that it took me as many years as it did to figure out that my masculinity isn't attached to that. And that there are tremendous benefits to uh, marriage and monogamy and what you can produce. And we don't even get to have that discussion because mm. right now, and I'll end on this, right now our religion is race. Mm. And th that is, that's, again, when, when every thought you have is tied through, well, how's this play in the racial Olympics? And, and virtually none of your thoughts are what does God think about this? Mm. Race is your real religion. And, and it's a shame that that's the society that we're leaving for young people. Uh, but that's what we're doing. I'll give you a final thought and then we'll get out of here and we'll see everybody. Sure. Tomorrow. I mean, uh, you, you make an excellent point. And I mean, there was a point where adultery was a crime on the books because people took marriage seriously, right? They believed that it was the 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 union between one man and one woman um, for one lifetime, with husband and wife dedicated to one another and the, and, the, and the fruitfulness that comes from that relationship. But to your point, over the course of years, we, every part of that marriage covenant, we've removed. We've removed the lifetime requirement. We've removed the man, the one man, one woman requirement. Um, the, the, the fruitfulness sort of desire all of those things have come out. So now it's basically just, you know, two adults in a consenting relationship with, you know, better than average jewelry. That's basically it. Um, and I think that that's a mistake because a society loses a lot when, when we become casual with, uh, you know, our sexual nature and our sexual desires. And, and, and we see this, Jason, because when we, when we make critiques uh, about the LGBT community, particularly gay men as it relates to monkeypox, and you read all the stuff, the piss orgies and all this other stuff, we, we see what uh, an animalistic sexual nature looks like. And straight men have that, uh, that at, at, at our base level, our sin nature is just as animalistic. So a guy who's, you know, whether he's at Freak Nick or the, or the Playboy Ranch, right, could express those same type of, of desires without any restraint. Um, so, so I think it's a mistake to, to look at adultery as, you know, a victimless crime or to, or to even look at sex as casual. And that's, and, and I'll end here, one of the things, and, and really the one issue, the situation and person that really brought this to light to me was all the conversation around Bill Cosby, right, and his charges. And, you know what it was. It was all sorts of, oh, he's about to buy NBC, and oh, they don't want to see the black man, and this, that, that, and the next. The one thing that no one ever said, I don't think I heard any cultural commentator, any, any religious figure, any, you know, DJ, any morning show host say, 
is that Bill Cosby was cheating on his wife. He was a serial philanderer for decades. That didn't even come up. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that that's his, that, that is, you know, the adultery is on the same criminal legal level as drugging women, which is the allegation against him, and raping women. But at some point, I think it should it should be raised. Like at the very least, the guy, you know, was serially unfaithful to his wife, and, and I think you know, we as a society should should speak to that. But it never came up because we live in a culture that doesn't really value marriage, um, that does not value monogamy, um, and does not value sex. Um, so for the, for us, it's all about individual pleasures and desires. Um, and never about fidelity to, to God's design for, for that gift. So, yeah, th this situation really does s say a lot about our culture um, in, in many ways. The monogamy, the race, and, you know, sort of the workplace conditions aspect. Thank you, D. Great job as Thank always. Uh, we'll play some tomorrow, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.